Hi there and welcome to the channel of a disappointed man with me Jason Kennedy, the disappointed man. Now the eagle-eyed among you may have already noticed that there are some books missing over here. It can mean only one thing. It's time for part six of my grand bookshelf tour. It's so long since I did part five which was interwar years part one but I've put all the links to the previous parts in the description below and there is even a playlist if you wish to check it out. I'm calling today's section Bloomsbury and Beyond and we'll terminate with some series of books. So the chronology will be a little mixed up there. That is why. So let's get started. I said Bloomsbury. The first offering is this huge biography of Lytton Strachey, one of the most famous beards in literary history. Shall I show you? just how large it was here. A magnificent effort. I wish I could grow one like that myself. I haven't got round to reading this yet. After him, we move on to Virginia Woolf. So this is Flush. If you haven't read this, I do recommend it. It's written from the point of view of a dog, and that is not the first time that's been tackled in the literature. Kafka did his investigations of a dog too, but another dog-themed book you may not be familiar with is this Sirius by Olaf Stapledon, where a man creates a super dog who is far more intelligent than any human being, and this dog then engages in a romantic relationship with a human woman. It's really a very interesting sci-fi book, and Stapledon was a hard scientist. I think he was a physicist. So it's really good on the science front. Then we have another Virginia Woolf. The Years. I haven't read all of these yet, but I have read this next one. A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas. A Room of One's Own is just a brilliant piece of writing. It really proves its case just with its own quality. It's excellent. Then to the Lighthouse. Mrs. Dalloway, which was a um, big influence on Christopher Isherwood, actually, who we'll be talking about in a moment. One of her late novels. I've read this one. This was really good. Between the Acts. A bit patchy, perhaps, but when it's good, it's really good. And then Orlando, a movie tie-in cover. I said I didn't like these very much, but I'm not actually sure who that is. Is it Kate Blanchett? I think it may be. And then finally, with Virginia Woolf, the enormous Hermione Lee biography with a rather elderly looking wolf on the cover. I don't think she actually lived to look that old. She resembles Miss Marple from the Agatha Christie TV shows there. And then one final wolf related book, her lover, Rita Sackville West with her novel, All Passion Spent, beautiful cover. And I've yet to get through this one. Okay, moving on next we have E.M. Forster. More movie tie-in covers? I said I didn't like them, didn't I? But with E.M. Forster, it's unavoidable. A Passage to India, now a major motion picture. A Room with a View, now a Merchant Ivory production. This one I don't think has been made into a movie. Maurice, or Maurice, his last novel, wasn't published during his lifetime. Then... This one I've read, Where Angels Fear to Tread, it's very good actually. It's about a high-spirited Latin woman living in England who runs away to Italy and believes that she's going to fall in love with a count or someone of this kind, but instead shacks up with an Italian dentist, much to the horror of the English family that she's left behind, who then go out to try and reclaim her and her infant and all ends in tragedy. Then The Longest Journey. This is excellent. It's about a um, teacher. Yes, I didn't really want to say the word because if you are a teacher then you'll identify very much with the predicament of the title character in this book. It really is amazingly penetrative in terms of the horrors of being a teacher because you can just feel truly trapped in that job, has a strange plot revolving around um, a kind of 
half-brother who keeps appearing on the scene and causing trouble, but a great read. Then a biography. It's the Furbank one with the um, wonderful picture on the front by Roger Fry. I love this portrait. That's a two volume in one book. And then another critical essay on or monograph on Forster. It's Lionel Trillings. It's a nice typography there. And that's all of the Forster. Now we'll look at my books dedicated to the 30s and some of its poets. The first two of these books I've shown before, regular viewers will know them. They're just concerned with the 30s generation generally. So British Writers of the 30s by Valentine Cunningham and the Auden generation. So we've got Auden, Spender and Isherwood there. And then this one, The Will to Believe by Richard Johnston there. So it just picks up on a number of novelists. We've got Graham Greene, Christopher Isherwood, Orwell, Edward Upward, Rex Warner and Evelyn War. I've got many books by all of those and they're all excellent. Then we move on to the poet's work themselves. So here's Stephen Spender's account of the 30s and what came afterwards. It was a time where writers had to take up strong political positions given the historical events that were going on at the time. So it's much concerned with that. Then a collection of his poetry. Evelyn War said Stephen Spender was an absolutely abysmal poet. And I do kind of see that. It's trying to be something completely different. It's really modernist poetry. It's not absolutely to my taste, but there are a few good moments. But what is more interesting with regard to Spender is his excellent biography. I just enjoyed this so much more than his poetry. He can write very well when he wishes to. And World Within World was great. There's a good moment where he has a lunch with T.S. Eliot and he says, T.S. Eliot, could you give me any advice on being a poet? And T.S. Eliot says, well, not really. Writing poetry, yes, but what's this being a poet business? But I think that really points towards the future and how we see things today, because people today aren't happy just to say, I write. They have to say, I'm a writer, as if that informs every moment of their waking existence. And Spender there was alluding to the same thing. He couldn't just be someone who wrote a few poems. He had to be that magnificent object of public scrutiny, a poet. Now, he also wrote a novel which is not very successful. There's a man in his swimming trunks on the cover. There's a lot of bathing in pre-Nazi Germany going on in this. And then we have his journals. Yes, even though he's not my favourite writer, I'm still rather obsessed with him. And these are quite entertaining. Just the elevated social circles he moves within. I could only dream of having such a life myself. Constant dinners with ambassadors. Then I have this biography of him too. That's all of the spender. Next we have Lewis McNeese, the Irish poet. He's a much more entertaining man. I would like to have spent a weekend with him. That would be great. Here's a critical study of him. Then a rather dry biography of him by John Stallworthy, but with a very nicely produced Faber edition. And then his autobiography. And this is a cracking read from his public school days at Marlborough and all his playing football and his drinking. And then a slim volume of his poetry. One of my favourite poems of any writer is in here, A Prayer Before Birth. I think I might just pause and read it to you, actually. It's that good. Here we go, Prayer Before Birth. I am not yet born, oh hear me. Let not the blood-sucking bat or the rat or the stoat or the club-footed ghoul come near me. I am not yet born, console me. I fear that the human race may with tall walls wall me, with strong drugs dope me, with wise lies lure me, on black racks rack me, in blood baths roll me. I am not yet born, provide me, with water to dandle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. I am not yet born, forgive me, for the sins that in me the world shall commit, my words when they speak me, my thoughts when they think me, 
my treason engendered by traitors beyond me, my life when they murder by means of my hands, my death when they live me. I am not yet born, rehearse me, in the parts I must play and the cues I must take when old men lecture me, bureaucrats hector me, mountains frown at me, lovers laugh at me, the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom and the beggar refuses my gift and my children curse me. I am not yet born, O oh, hear me. Let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. I am not yet born, O oh, fill me, with strength against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing, and against all those who would dissipate my entirety, would blow me like thistledown, hither and thither, or hither and thither, like water held in the hands, would spill me. Let them not make me a stone, and let them not spill me. Otherwise, kill me. Just such a powerful poem by a great poet, Lewis McNeese. Next up, some experimental novels by two writers who both happen to be from Birmingham. The first one is Henry Green, who was born into an incredibly wealthy family. His father was an industrialist and he wrote these very strange novels. The first one here, Nothing, is just told in dialogue form. Then we have another compilation, Loving, Living and Party Going. I really need to get these read, but they're not the easiest novels to work your way through. They really are difficult texts. Then his autobiography, Pack My Bag. He went to Eton, but he doesn't mention it here, just uses another name. And then two very interesting books by a man from a working class background who became an extremely competent Latinist. It's B.S. Johnson. And this one, House Mother Normal, is great. It's first person accounts of dementia patients in a very strange nursing home being operated by the eponymous Mother Normal. And what he does, B.S. Johnson, is he arranges the words on the page to reflect what is going on in the consciousness of the various patients. And they become more and more fragmented as we go on. So here is a later patient. Yeah, it's really interesting the way this is done. So I did write about that on the graduate program. Next up is perhaps his most famous or notorious work. It's the infamous novel in a box, The Unfortunates. So I'll just take this out and I'll show you what's going on. So you have all these sections of text and apart from the opening and the conclusion you can take them out and arrange them however you wish so each time you'll get some random selection right like a jigsaw so he had in every one of his works pretty much one of these interesting ideas going on about the book form itself in Alberto Angelo, for example, there are windows cut into the pages and you can look through and see what's going to happen on a later page that you haven't read yet. Yeah, very inventive, right? So the B.S. Johnson novel in a box. Now we're going to move on to Isherwood. Now, Christopher Isherwood is definitely one of my favourite writers. He's so good at observing others and he's also a very charming companion to lead you through his life and times. So the first one, Crater Violet, all marked up because it's the one I'm going to review next on the channel. So I won't say anything other than it is brilliant. Then The Memorial, haven't read that one yet. This one is excellent too. It was a movie, A Single Man. It's a day in the life and it's heavily influenced by Mrs. Dalloway and it's set in California of the 60s. He was still writing great stuff well into his senior years, unlike most writers. Goodbye to Berlin, which was the source material for Cabaret, also an incredibly successful movie. Contains the famous line, I am a camera. Kathleen and Frank about his mother and father's relationship. 
The World in the Evening. These are very nice editions I have of these. I like these small illustrations. A Meeting by the River. This was very good. Down there on a visit. It's kind of in three sections, each one focusing on a different person he's met. And the last one about a man who was supposedly the most expensive male prostitute in the world is a tour de force. It's absolutely fantastic piece of writing. Exhumations. I think this is his debut. All the conspirators. It was pretty awful, actually. It didn't show much promise, but he kept plugging away and got a lot better very quickly. And then Lions and Shadows. I also really enjoyed this. It's a kind of buildings Roman, but it's not. It's semi-autobiographical, so you're never quite sure what is true and what isn't, but it's very effective piece of writing again. And then some of his hardbacks. This one has the terrible illustration on the cover, and it's also really boring. It's about his engagement with Buddhism. I think it's really difficult to write interestingly about religion, at least in the 20th century. Christopher and His Kind, his kind of coming out book, which placed him firmly at the centre of the gay liberation movement. And then two volumes of his diaries, which are wonderful reading. This one, The Sixties, great picture again on the cover. And volume one of these. Another excellent picture. It has these handy ribbons so you can bookmark where you are. And that is all my issue would. Let's wrap up with a look at three series that I've enjoyed. Now, the first of these is not strictly speaking a series. You don't have to read them in the right order. But whereas Isherwood wrote many novels, but they don't form a single coherent story world. That's not his project. That is what you find in the works of Barbara Pym. So characters move between her different novels in a very satisfying and rich way. This one's excellent, one of her late ones, Quartet in Autumn. This one is not good. It was published posthumously and it's really a sketch. It's not very well developed. Then Less Than Angels, another posthumous one, Crompton Hadnet. They're full of poetry. They're very gentle. They often focus on spinsters or quirky female characters leading these rather lonely lives. This one was awful though, an academic question. This is one of the best, The Sweet Dove Died. It's about an antiques dealer and a couple of men that she encounters who may be homosexual. Full of poetry, this one, some tame gazelle. They often have clergyman characters, like a curate who's rather dishy. Two spinsters living together, Jane and Prudence sisters. This is magnificent. This was great too. She's also often compared with Jane Austen, or I should say Jane Austen fans are often big fans of Barbara Pym's novels too. A Glass of Blessings was wonderful. A candidate for perhaps her best novel, Excellent Women. So it's not just for female readers though. I'm a man and I've deeply enjoyed these and I've read all of these. I can do videos about her work. No Fun Return of Love was really good too. And then there are some sort of odd bits. Um, Civil to Strangers, which is like her notes from her journals. And then there is an autobiography, A Very Private Eye, and I even have a biography. She was a huge fan of Denton Welsh as well. If you like Denton Welsh, you probably will enjoy the work of Barbara Pym. Now, let's look at two that are really series. Next, we have the Map and Lucia series by E.F. Benson. He was productive during the Edwardian period. I think he wrote over 100 books and he was also mayor for a considerable period of the town of Rye on the coast, often voted the most beautiful town in the whole of Britain. And he wrote these Map and Lucia books. As I said, there are six and I've got all of them. And Miss Map is an absolute battle axe, like the ultimate nosy neighbour. And they're really full of high camp as well. If you like the humour of Julian Clary or you enjoy the performances of Prunella Scales, who played um, Miss Map, I believe, in a TV adaptation of these that I will link to in the description, then 
you are sure to enjoy them. Inside the town, there are a host of quirky characters. One of my favorite is the um, resident Bohemian who paints, it's a female. She's painted most of the men in the town naked, which is quite amusing. Here we go. And the last one, Lucia. In London, they're rather patchy, they are hack work, but the characters are charming. So I did really enjoy those. Last one. It's England's Proust, Anthony Pohl. It's not Powell. He was rather posh and he insisted that it was pronounced Pohl. So this one is at Lady Molly's. I think there are 11 or 12 in the sequence. I don't have all of them here. I'm not going to lead you all the way through them. But what I would say is technically they're brilliantly written and they are indeed rather like Proust, except nothing could have prepared me for just how humorous they are. They are laugh out loud funny, and they often center on um, the art world or Bohemia, and they're just fascinating books. I was rather put off by his kind of public image. These, um, the content of these were just so different to what I expected, and I'm so glad that I picked them all up out here in Taiwan. So there you have it. That was my bookshelf tour. If I seem a little below par today, I do have a stinking cold, but I just wanted to make a video anyway. Hopefully I'll have recovered and not be sneezing this much when I make my next video, which will be the World Cup tag on Tuesday. So please look out for that. Now I must depart. So I'll just say my traditional farewell. Be safe, be strong, and I shall see you anon. Nanu Nanu.